Section 1.2, speed and velocity. Both of these terms, speed and velocity, exist in your vocabulary. You probably use them from time to time, but I'm wondering if you can actually distinguish between the two. It's actually a very new concept to most people studying science, and one that is introduced always in grade 11 university preparation physics. So we're going to start off by defining speed. We have a good understanding of what speed is kind of in our brain, a working definition of what speed is. We know when speed is fast and when speed is slow. Speed is defined as the total distance traveled divided by the total time taken to travel that distance. So let's start with the symbol for speed is the Greek letter V. It is given that symbol because it comes from the Latin term velocita, which means speed. The unit of measurement for speed is meters per second. You're probably most familiar with kilometers per hour and less familiar with meters per second, but we will actually be able to convert between meters per second and kilometers per hour in this section. We'll teach you how. And eventually you'll become more and more familiar with these two units for speed. Now there's an equation for speed and that equation is delta D over delta T. This is our equation. Can highlight it for us. Delta D is a symbol we're familiar with. We studied it before. It means distance. This is from section 1.1. And delta T is the elapsed time. Okay, let's get right to work and try an example using this equation. We're going to use the GRASP method to solve this equation, so read it carefully, keeping in mind the quantities, the symbols, and the directions. Your dog runs in a straight line for a distance of 43 meters in 28 seconds. What is your dog's average speed? So we're given a distance of 43 meters. and a time, or an elapsed time, of 28 seconds. And what they want us to find, what's required, is the average speed. We know an equation, it's delta D over delta T, and we can sub and solve. 43 meters divided by 28 seconds. We punch this into our calculator, we have 43 meters, which is two significant digits, divided by 28 seconds, which is two significant digits. So after you punch it into your calculator, report your answer to two significant digits. 43 divided by 28, we end up with 1.5 meters per second. Therefore, my dog's speed is 1.5 meters per second. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about average velocity. Average velocity is the total displacement or change in position divided by the total time for that displacement. The symbol for velocity is the letter V. This time it has an arrowhead on top. And the unit of measure, just like speed, is either meters per second or kilometers per hour, whichever is more practical in the context. And the equation looks very similar to the one above for speed. The equation is delta D with an arrowhead divided by delta T. So when there's an arrowhead on top of the quantity, it changes with the quantity. This is no longer distance. This is displacement. And this, my friends, is time. Okay, so 
Let's try an example. On a windy day, the position of a balloon changes as it's blown 82 meters north away from a child in 15 seconds. What is the average velocity of the balloon? So we're given a displacement. The balloon has been displaced 82 meters north in an elapsed time of 15 seconds and they want us to find the average velocity of the balloon. Notice that I am still following the grasp method without writing the word grasp or even using the letters. However, folks, you have to write down what is given and what is required and then sub and solve. Trust me, this step right here, before you even attempt to answer it, is the most difficult. And if you get into the practice or habit of writing down what's given and required, the rest will become easier and easier. Okay, we know that we can use the equation we just learned, delta D displacement divided by elapsed time. That's 82 meters north divided by 15 seconds. We have two significant digits divided by two significant digits. So give your answer to two significant digits. When you punch this into your calculator, you should end up with 5.5 .5 meters per second north. Now, I told you the units were meters per second, and I've written down that the answer is in meters per second. But remember this, and here's a little kind of funny joke that I use to remember. Whatever you do to the numbers, you do to the units. So if you're dividing the numbers, then you're going to divide the units. So if we divide 82 by 15, then we're going to divide meters by seconds. So our units are meters per second, 5.5 .5 meters per second north. Okay? Whatever you do unto your numbers, you shall do unto your units. All right, give yourself a nice therefore statement. Therefore, the average velocity of the balloon is 5.5 .5 meters per second north. Okay. Now here's another example. A subway train travels at an average velocity of 22.3 kilometers per hour west. How long will it take for the subway train to undergo a displacement of 241 meters west? So we're given a velocity of 22.3 kilometers per hour west. And we're given a displacement of 241 meters west and they want us to find how long it will take what are they asking us for how long it will take they are asking us for the elapsed time how long is not a length they're asking for how long it will take they're asking us for the amount of time it will take for the subway train to travel at that speed over that distance in that direction. Okay, this question is really important for a couple of reasons. First off, this is the first time we're gonna convert kilometers per hour into meters per second. If you notice, the displacement's in meters, but the velocity's in kilometers. And we wanna make sure we also convert the time from hours into seconds. So this is where you'll come to in your notes to remember how to convert from kilometers per hour to meters per second. So when we're converting from kilometers per hour to meters per second, we have two units we have to consider. We've done many conversions, but all of them have only converted one unit at a time. Here we're converting both kilometers into meters and hours into seconds. So we have to do them both almost simultaneously. So how do we do this? Start by writing down the 
measurement, 22.3, the original unit, kilometers per hour. Now instead of kilometers, we want meters. And in order to get rid of the kilometers, if we divided by kilometers, we would have one on top and one on the bottom. So these would cancel out. In order to do that, you have to state the relationship between the kilometer and the meter. And that relationship is there are 1,000 meters in one kilometer. So when you write that, now you can cancel out the kilometers. They cancel each other out. Now at the bottom here we have hours, but we want seconds instead. In order to get rid of the hours on the bottom, it'd be helpful if we had an hour on top. Now, you have to tell me the relationship between the hour and the second. I know you know the relationship between the second and the minute and the minute and the hour, but do you know the relationship between the hour and the second? In one hour, there are 3,600 seconds. If you state that relationship between the hour and the second, you can cancel the hours out. Now, we multiply everything on top and divide by everything on the bottom. So we have 22.3 times 1,000 meters times 1 divided by 1 times 3,600 seconds. I need you to all punch this into your calculator. Do it with me because we all have to get the same answer. When you do, you should get 6.19 meters per second west. Now, I've used the same number of significant digits, three sig digs, as there were in the original. So it's 6.19. OK, so we've converted from kilometers per hour into meters per second. All right, now we need to find delta t. We are given velocity displacement and we need to find delta t. So let's take a look at what equation we're going to use. We know this equation, velocity is equal to delta d over delta t. But we have to rearrange this equation to get delta t by itself. Right now it's in the denominator and we need it by itself but up top in the numerator position. So how do we get it there? Here's a trick. We're going to multiply both sides by delta t. When you do, these delta t's will cancel out and we are left with delta t times velocity equals displacement. So the delta t is now in the numerator, not the denominator. That's the good first step. However, it's not by itself it's surgically attached to that velocity and we have to get rid of it. So we have to perform an operation to get rid of it. In order to get rid of it, we can divide both sides by velocity. If we do, these velocities will cancel out and we're left with delta t is equal to delta d over velocity. It takes a few steps to rearrange an equation. Eventually you'll do it so often and in across so many different courses, both math and science, and all disciplines of science, that you'll be able to rearrange real quickly. Especially in physics, when you've rearranged equation once, you'll tend to remember how to do it the second time, so you might be able to skip these steps. So let's sub and solve. I'm just going to move it up here so we can sub and solve this. We have 241 meters west over a velocity of 6.19 meters per second west. Punch it into our calculator and tell me what you get. We have three significant digits divided by three significant digits, so your answer should be to three significant digits. If you punch this in correctly, you should get 38.9 seconds. Now when I write the units down, I know that time is measured in seconds, but can I justify that by looking at the equation, meters divided by meters per second, and I end up with seconds. Remember I told you earlier that whatever you do to the numbers, you do unto the units. 
So if we're dividing meters, meters divided by meters per second, we should end up with seconds, but let's prove this mathematically. Back in elementary school, when you were taught how to divide fractions, you were told that you never really divide fractions. You always multiply them. Whenever you're told to divide a fraction, instead you multiply by the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of meters per second is the flip of this. I'm gonna just do a little visual here. We want the reciprocal. Seconds divided by meters. So when dividing fractions, instead we multiply by the reciprocal. When multiplying by the reciprocal now, we have meters times seconds divided by meters. We have a meter on top and a meter on the bottom, so they cancel out and we are left with seconds. So we've just proved that the unit should be the seconds. If you do this unit analysis, it actually is a way for you to prove that you've done the calculation correctly. If you analyze the units, they should help you to understand whether or not you've done the question correctly. Okay, so we talked about speed and we talked about velocity. But how do these two relate to each other? Well, one's a scalar quantity and one's a vector quantity. Let's take a look at this racetrack. This racetrack has a path length of 400 meters. Let's say you ran around this track and it took you 10 seconds. You could find your speed. So you started here. And you went all the way around and ended up right here. So you did 400 meters in 10 seconds. If you wanted to find your speed, it's equal to distance traveled 400 meters divided by 10 seconds. So you end up with a speed of 40 meters per second. It's very fast, congratulations. Now, what's my velocity? If I ran it 400 meters in 10 seconds, what's my velocity? Well, velocity is displacement over elapsed time. I know my elapsed time is 10 seconds, but what's my displacement if I start here and I end here? So I'm going from here to here. If you look at the start position and the end position, they are the same. So if in that elapsed time, I end up exactly where I started, then my displacement is zero. And if my displacement is zero, then my velocity is zero. So my speed is 40 meters per second, but my velocity is zero. Okay? Understand that these two are different. One deals with scalar quantities and one deals with vector quantities. So these are two very different notions, and you have to know that they are different. All right. Uniform motion. Uniform motion is the motion of an object at constant speed in a straight line. There are two components to uniform motion. The first is speed, and the second is direction. If you're traveling in a straight line or in the same direction at a constant speed, then you have uniform motion. If an object's speed changes, or if an object doesn't travel in a straight line, then it has non-uniform motion. Okay, so know the difference between uniform motion and non-uniform motion. We're going to take a bit of a detour now, and we're going to move into graphing. We're still talking about speed and velocity, but we're going to analyze these quantities using graphs. The first type of graph that we'll look at in this section, in this course actually, is called a position time graph. If you look on the y-axis, there's position measured in meters east, and on the x-axis there is time measured in seconds. And here we have the position time data for a rolling ball. So we've plotted the ball's position over different periods in time, and we end up with a straight line 
And what mathematicians love to do whenever they see a straight line, they just can't even help themselves, is they like to take the slope of the line. And to take the slope of the line, that's rise over run. And in this case, it's the change in y divided by the change in x, which is the change. The y-axis is position, so it would be the change in position divided by the change in the x-axis is time. So it's delta d divided by delta t, which looks really familiar. That is the equation for velocity. I'm taking out my red pen and I'm drawing my bars of memorization. If you have a position time graph, the slope of a position time graph gives you velocity of the object. So let's find the velocity of this rolling ball by finding the slope of the line. So slope equals velocity, and the velocity is equal to d2 minus d1 over t2 minus t1. Pick any two points. I'm going to choose this guy and this guy. So my initial position, d1, is here, and my d2 is here. My initial time, t1, corresponds to my initial position, and my final time, t2, is right here. We can sub and solve. We have 40 meters east minus 0 over 10 seconds minus 0. If we punch this in, we end up with 40 minus 0 over 10 minus 0 is 4 meters per second east. So the slope of the line, therefore, the velocity of the rolling ball is 4 meters per second east. Okay. Now, not all position time graphs look like this, like a straight line with slope. Some of them look different. Let's take a look at some different position time graphs. Here we have an object, a basketball, which is at rest at some position east of the person. So over time, at the beginning, the object's position is somewhere east of the person. And over time, its position does not change. It's holding the same position throughout the entire period of time. So this graph shows an object that's at rest. It's at a position east of the reference point. It's not moving, so its velocity is zero. If you ever see a position time graph that has a horizontal line, know that the object is not moving, that the object is at rest. Its velocity is zero. Okay. Now, in the second example, the object is still at rest. This time it's located at a position west of the reference point. Now, this y-axis is labeled east. To denote west, we need a negative position because negative west, negative east rather, is west. So this object will be at rest straight horizontal line, but it'll be below the x-axis in the negative area. So because it's negative, negative east is the same thing as west. So it's at rest. It's west of the reference point, And the velocity is 0. All right. Now we have a person running in a straight line. And this person running in a straight line has velocity. And its velocity is constant.
and it's in the east direction. It's traveling east. And both speed and direction are constant. When you say constant velocity, both speed and direction must be constant. We say this object has uniform motion. What is it going to look like on the graph? It's going to look like a straight line with slope. And if we found the slope of that line, it would tell us the velocity of the sprinter. OK. In this next example, we have a bike. Imagine the person on the bike race, the person running on the track. The person on the bike would probably win because he's got a constant velocity in the east direction. I'm just going to actually copy and paste this. But he's faster. How do we show faster on a position time graph? Well, the faster an object is, the steeper its line would be. Because slope is velocity. And if you calculate the steepness or slope of a line, you get the velocity. So the greater the slope, the greater the velocity. OK. In the second example, we have the cyclist traveling at a constant velocity. But now moving in the west direction. And the way we show west direction is by showing a negative slope. So this person's traveled at some position away and is traveling back towards the starting position. So it's traveling in the opposite direction of east, which is called west. So here we have constant velocity in the west direction. All right. So these are some examples of position time graphs for different types of motion. We have an object that's not moving, an object that's moving at a constant velocity. And then the only other possibility for an object's motion is one that looks like this. This is a position time graph for an object that is moving with non-uniform motion. And non-uniform motion means that the object's velocity is changing over time. So if you look, it's not a horizontal line and it's not a straight line. It's an upward curving line. We see that the object's velocity, imagine if velocity is the steepness of a line, we can see that over time, it's starts off not steep, but this slope gets steeper and steeper as time goes on. So we can do a couple of things. We can find the object's velocity at a particular instant. So we can find it at one second, at two seconds. Or we can find the average velocity. First, we're going to find the instantaneous velocity. Here come my bars of memorization. This is how you find the instantaneous velocity. The instantaneous velocity is equal to the slope of a tangent line at a specific point. Tangent line is a very mathematical statement or concept. And it's basically defined as a line that touches a curve at one particular point. We're going to use a tangent line to find the instantaneous velocity at the point t equals 2 seconds. So that's at this point right here. What we're essentially finding is how steep is the curve at this particular point. In order to find out, what we're going to have to do is draw a tangent line and then place this tangent line so that it touches the curve only at t equals 2. Bear with me here. we got to move this line so that it touches the curve only at t equals 2 seconds. It cannot cross over and touch at multiple points like it is here. We have to move it so that it touches the curve only at that point. And there's only one tangent line for one specific point. It's a little tricky to draw, 
So imagine if you're drawing this on a test, you have to be careful to draw it as precise as possible, but also keep in mind that I know that you'll be doing the best you can. Okay, so I want to find the instantaneous velocity at two seconds. So I've drawn this tangent line. Now my job is to find the slope of this tangent line at this particular time. So I'm going to use any two points along this curve. You can choose literally any two points. I'm going to choose this point, which has this displacement and this time, and this point, which has this displacement and this time. This is position 1, and this is position 2. So the instantaneous velocity at t equals 2 seconds is equal to the slope of this line, which is d2 minus d1 over t2. Ooh, no vector there. Over t2 minus t1. If we sub it in, position 2 is 8.0 meters east. Position 1 is 0. T2 is 3 seconds. And T1 is 1 second. So we have 8 minus 0 divided by 3 minus 1. Try this in your head, but you know what? Verify it using a calculator. We end up with 4.0 meters per second east. Okay. So we found the instantaneous velocity at t equals 2 seconds. And it's 4 meters per second east. Now, since the velocity is changing over the entire time, can I find the average velocity for the entire trip? Well, you can find the average velocity. Here's how. Behind the bars of memorization, we have this statement. The average velocity between any two points on a position time graph is equal to the slope of the line joining the two points. Okay, I'm going to clean up my graph. I wish you could do the same. I want to find the average velocity between 0 and 4 seconds from here to here. So how do I do that? What I have to do is draw a line over the interval. And now I take the slope of that line. If I find the slope of this line, it'll give me the average velocity for the four seconds. So we have this is our final position. This is our initial position. This is T1. And this is now t2. So let's find the average velocity over the interval. I can keep this a little smaller. So you can see the graph where we're writing this. We have d2 minus d1 over t2 minus t1. That's 16 meters east minus zero over 4.0 seconds. Punch this into your calculator, you should end up with 4.0 meters per second east. So the average velocity over the four second interval is 4 meters per second east. Perfect. Now folks, I don't know if you are anything like me, but sometimes when I'm writing a test or a quiz, if I end up getting the same answer over and over, I feel like something is up, like someone's trying to mess with me, and I get a little paranoid whether or not I have the correct answer. We found the instantaneous velocity at 2 seconds, and it was 4 meters per second east. Then we found the average velocity from 0 to 4 seconds, and it too was 4 meters per second east. Is that a coincidence? Am I being paranoid? Or is there a relationship between 
the interval 0 to 4 and the single point 0 to or the single point 2.0. So if you look at the interval 0 to 4, what's right in the middle of 0 to 4 is 2. So here's the entire interval 0 to 4 seconds and right smack in the middle is 2 seconds. When we found the instantaneous velocity at 2 seconds, it was 4 meters per second east. When we found the velocity at the entire interval 0 to 4 seconds, it too was 4 meters per second east. The relationship between the point 2 seconds and the interval 0 to 4 is that 2 is the midpoint of the interval 0 to 4 seconds. If you find the instantaneous velocity over an interval, it is equal to, let me restate that, if you find the average velocity over an interval, it is equal to the instantaneous velocity at the midpoint of the interval. So let's look at this for a minute. I'm going to clean this up. Here is a line that is showing the entire interval 0 to 4 seconds. And I can move it. And this line is equivalent to the slope at 2 seconds. So the instantaneous velocity at 2 seconds is equal to the average velocity over the entire interval. 2 is the midpoint of the interval 0 to 4 seconds. So if I asked you to find the instantaneous velocity at 2 seconds, you could draw a tangent line and find the slope of that line. Another way to do it is instead of drawing a tangent line, which is sometimes tricky, you can draw, choose an interval such that 2 is the midpoint. So you can choose 0 to 4, find the slope of that line, which is much easier to draw. Or you could even choose a smaller interval, like 1 and 3 seconds. If you find the slope between the interval 1 and 3, what's the midpoint of 1 and 3? It's 2. Take a look. All of these slopes are parallel. All of these slopes have the same steepness. Therefore, they have the same velocity. So I'm going to write this down so that you remember. We weren't being paranoid, though normally I mostly am paranoid. The average velocity over an interval is equal to the instantaneous velocity at the midpoint of the interval. So that's something that we need to remember. Kind of a cool trick. It'll actually make you solving graphing problems a lot easier because Finding the average velocity over an interval is so much easier than drawing a tangent line. Tra tangent lines, I'm sure, in your first tangent line that you've ever drawn today has proven to be a little bit tricky. So knowing that the average velocity over an interval is equivalent to or equal to the instantaneous velocity at the midpoint of an interval is a piece of information that is going to make your life a lot simpler. All right. So let's continue with our interpretation. Now we know different shapes of lines. Here we have a skier who is going down a hill. And as you go down a hill, your velocity will get faster and faster and faster. So we have to show what a position time graph looks like for increasing velocity in the east direction. east direction. The slope starts off 
not too fast, and then ends up really fast. So we end up with an upward curving line that looks like this. Okay, this, I'm gonna draw it just a little cleaner in one shot, is what increasing velocity in the east direction looks like on a position time graph. Now, we want to show in the next example what this looks like, increasing velocity, but in the west direction. I'm going to be really lazy and copy this like this. Get that dot in there as well. Increasing velocity, but this time in the west direction. So west on a y-axis that's labeled east would be below zero. And this is our zero here. So we're below the x-axis. And we start off not so fast, and we end up fast. So our line looks like this. It's downward curving below the x-axis. This is what increasing velocity, just realized I didn't copy all that, increasing velocity in the west direction looks like. OK. Next. We have a guy on a bike who was coasting up a hill. And you know that if you are approaching a hill and just start coasting, your velocity will start off really high, but end up really low. So this graph will look like this. This is what decreasing velocity looks like. In the east direction. Now, if you're into patterns, can you predict what decreasing velocity in the west direction will look like? And that is going to look like this. Okay, we start off really fast and we end up really slow. It was steep and then it's not. It's also below the x-axis because we are dealing in the west direction. Okay, folks, try this homework question and there should be a corresponding LMS quiz as well. Good luck.